Hello and welcome to the second part of the Introduction to Hinduism lecture. So this is going to presume that you've watched the first part, so hopefully you have. And again, I'm not going to go over all of the slides in this lecture, so please feel free to do that on your own, either before or after, for more details and more information. So just to, uh, I know there's a lot of information on this slide, don't worry about that, but the one thing I do want to point out, again, is that Hinduism has existed for a very, very long time. And because of the many different sacred texts that have been highlighted throughout different periods, and just because of the natural form of evolution that religions take, the longer that they're in existence, Hinduism has broken off into many different darsanas or schools, right? Each with their own emphasis and sometimes even with differing metaphysics. And so this is just sort of an overall view of the main schools or branches um, of Hinduism, and I want to note that they're classified into two separate categories. So on the right, we have what are considered the orthodox or astika darsanas, and these are considered orthodox because they accept the authority of the Vedas, right? So all of these schools on the right accept the authority of the Vedas in that they acknowledge them as sacred texts and then build their conceptions of metaphysics and epistemology off of those texts. Those are considered distinct from those on the right, or I'm sorry, on the left, which are considered the unorthodox or Gnostica schools. And these are unique in that they consider, um, they reject the authority of the Vedas, right? So they do not accept those texts as uh, true or authoritative, and thus their metaphysics tends to be much different. And this is where we see Buddhism and also Jainism as being, again, offshoots of Hinduism, but really considered separate religious traditions in that their basic conceptions of reality differ greatly. And we'll see that in the coming week when we look at Buddhism more specifically. But just again, it is considered an unorthodox branch or school of Hinduism because it rejects the authority of the Vedas. So now I want to jump ahead to the main text that this lecture focuses on, which is the Bhagavad Gita. So as I mentioned, the Bhagavad Gita is part of the world's longest epic poem known as the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is 5,000 pages long, very long poem, but the Bhagavad Gita is only 100 pages of it, and it translates as the Song of God, Right? And so this is considered to be, again, probably one of the most recognizable and popular texts in Hinduism, especially in the West. Um, you'll even sometimes see uh, various traditions uh, who worship Krishna passing out little texts of the Bhagavad Gita. It's, it's a beautiful poem if you're ever interested in reading it. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is are the primary lessons or teachings emphasized in the Gita, especially so that we can contrast them to the main teachings that we saw in the previous lecture, which are associated more with the Vedas and the Upanishads. So the basic plot of the Bhagavad Gita is the battle of Kurukshetra. And so this is a battle where two parts of the same family are seen at, are in, in, about to engage in battle against one another. And as we often see in the West especially, one of these parts of the family, the Pandavas, are meant to represent good, while the Kauravas are meant to represent evil. And this has to do with the fact that they have enslaved um, a number of people that they've captured, they have violated certain treaties with the Pandavas, and so because of their inability to, because of the Pandavas' inability to achieve peace, it is sort of culminated in this battle, right, this final battle between good and evil. But if you remember from our introduction, good and evil, that form of dualism is part of Maya, which is an illusion, and so one of the main teachings of this battle is how we should understand our role in these types of dilemmas or challenges between good and evil while understanding that within the larger concept of Brahman and one ultimate reality. And so the primary figures in the story are Arjuna, who is a Pandavas warrior, and he is someone who is considered to be, um, you know, pretty high up in the caste system. He um, would be part of the uh, 
uh, Kshatriya, excuse me, Kshatriya class or caste, uh, right, as a warrior. So not quite a Brahmin, right, but someone who is very active. He's part of the royal family. And again, as part of the Pandavas clan, he is seen as embodying an overall good moral character. And he has someone who is driving his chariot. So in these battles, right, at this historical time period, you would have a horse-drawn carriage. You would have someone who was, you know, in charge of the reins for the horses, and then you would have the person in in the chart in the cart um, or the chariot in the back with their bow and arrow, right? Who would be in charge of the fighting? And interestingly enough, this entire symbol with the chariot, the horses, the charioteer, the archer, these are actually also metaphors for the different parts of Hindu metaphysics, right? So the idea is that. Um, the charioteer is going to be Krishna, who is in this case an incarnation of Vishnu. And so that's going to be our connection with our Atman. Arjuna, the archer in the back, is going to be our Jiva, right, our personality. The uh, chariot itself is going to be our temporary body. The horses, right, leading the way are the gunas, right? So there are all these different sorts of like metaphors to the different parts of reality. But the main idea here is that Arjuna is about to go into battle against members of his own family. But he is having a very intense dilemma, an internal dilemma with himself, because he finds himself torn between different dharmas or duties. Specifically, he wants to fight for good and feels obligated to as a warrior, but understands that killing, especially members of one's own family, is an evil act. Right? And so he's torn between his obligations to his family and his obligations to his caste as a warrior. And so he decides to consult his charioteer named Krishna. And of course, when he, Arjuna is talking to Krishna, Arjuna doesn't realize that Krishna is in fact an incarnation of God, of Vishnu. But as this conversation ensues, it starts to become more apparent to Ar Arjuna. So. Arjuna turns to Krishna, shares his moral dilemma with him, and all of a sudden time stops on the battlefield, okay? And so the story in the Bhagavad Gita really takes place in this sort of bubble, this uh, frozen period of time where Arjuna and Krishna can have these intense philosophical discussions where they can sort out this moral dilemma and then the ensuing result, right, will follow whether or not Arjuna should fight in this battle, right? So he's seeking guidance from Krishna, which is, again, in fact, the incarnation of Vishnu. And so we're going to see how this conversation um, plays out. So again, Arjuna is having a crisis of dharma of duty before this battle, and this is meant to be, again, probably something that is analogous to any moral dilemma one might have, right? So even though we might not, you know, identify with his particular dilemma, we are often torn between what different obligations that we might have and so have trouble figuring out what the right thing for us to do is. So again, Arjuna's split is between his family, right? The Karavas in this case are his cousins, but he's also obligated to his station, right? His place in the caste as a Pandava's warrior. So what are the outcomes of this? Well, if Arjuna fights, right, if he kills the Karavas, right, his cousins, he'll be killing his family members in battle. And the idea, right, is that this must occur because they've exhausted every other possibility of resolving the issue with the Karavas. And it's sort of implied that if Arjuna and the other Pandavas do not fight the Karavas, right, this evil clan, that the Karavas will possibly put the rest of his family in danger, right? So it's sort of, you know, having to kill some of your family members to save the rest of your family, right? And so that's, that's why he feels compelled to fight. If Arjuna does not fight, though, well, then he's failing to fulfill his dharma as a warrior, right? and risks his people becoming enslaved to the Karavas, he might also appear a coward for failing to stand up for what is right, but he will have avoided killing his family members, right, and violating those, uh, what are considered to be special obligations we have. So what is Krishna's advice? Now, this is really important to understand because Hinduism does not 
advocate violence. But that's going to seem at odds with what Krishna, or again Vishnu, is going to advise Arjuna to do. So Krishna is going to advise Arjuna to fight. So it's really important for us to stand, understand why Krishna is giving Arjuna that advice, given that, again, Hinduism is not advocating violence here. What is going on here? Why would God want someone to kill members of their own family? So to understand this in the context of the larger Hindu teachings, we first have to understand again that this is a tradition which is known as Sanatana Dharma, right? The uh, path of righteous, right, and uh, duty, right, sacred duty, and also um, to try to achieve enlightenment. And so Krishna is going to remind Arjuna of his duty as a warrior in this case. And again, the idea there is that you are serving a function in a larger context, right, towards a certain goal. So as a warrior, and in this case, as a warrior for the Pandavas, someone who is obligated to do what is right. And again, he reminds him that they have not just jumped into battle. They have really exhausted all of the other peaceful possibilities for resolving this conflict. And so this is the only remaining option to protect his family since all other means of resolution have been attempted but failed. So again, this is not an advocation of violence just if you're a warrior, period, but that this is something that has to occur for the greater good since, in this case, all other attempts have failed. Krishna also discusses with Arjuna the notion of karmic justice, right? So the te teaching about karma that we touched upon earlier here is sort of brought down to, um, you know, how it affects people in a particular lifetime, right? In a particular embodiment, a particular reincarnation, right? He talks to him about, look, if these individuals die on the battlefield, if you kill them, then that was their fate, right? And thus it was deserved as a result of the karma that they have accumulated for what they have done, right? So they have earned death in battle as a result of their own actions, right? Which they engaged upon freely earlier in their life or in previous lives. So if Arjuna does not fight, the teaching here is that they will simply endure the consequences of their karma in some other way, right? You're not, by not killing them in this battle, you're not saving them from their karmic fate. They will simply die some other way. And one of the most important lessons is for Arjuna to overcome that avidya. And this is the teaching of self-knowledge. It's actually even a mistake for Arjuna to think that his cousins could ever really die. Because what Ar uh, Arjuna would be killing is merely a temporary body that their Atman or their soul is manifested in. You can't ever kill someone's soul. Right? And so you're not actually ending their existence. They're not really dying. All you're doing is fulfilling the karmic fate that they have earned, right? Their souls will continue on, be reborn again in samsara, right? Or anyone who is enlightened will achieve moksha, right? So their bodies may die, but their souls can never die. So this is supposed to help alleviate Arjuna's uh, guilt, right, over the idea that he's killing members of his own family. Right, and so there's a little bit more information here about why we confuse um, our true selves with our jivas. Uh, just so you know, some of the, the terminology changes here in the Bhagavad Gita. So instead of talking about Atman and Jiva, you see a discussion of Purusha and Prakriti. So Purusha would be um, considered your consciousness or your Atman, and your Prakriti would be more your Jiva, right? Or the physical, um, or I'm sorry, the personality that you result that you develop as a result of having a physical body, right? And so sometimes these are called the knower in the field, right? Consciousness or material objects. So just know that these are, are similar ideas, but come under different terminology in this case. So please feel free to take a look at these other slides. And also there is some information towards the bottom of this PowerPoint that goes into more detail about the gunas, which I discussed pretty clear, uh, pretty thoroughly in the previous um, PowerPoint. So I'm just going to go over one more time how this plays into the larger metaphysics. All right. So again, we still have this notion of pantheism, right? The idea that there is one ultimate reality. 
but that we are mistakenly under the belief that the physical world we exist in is the most real thing, when in fact that which is called maya is really an illusion, right? Brahman again can be separated from the part of Brahman that is within us, our Atman, our true selves, and those that Atman is again temporarily housed in samsara, right? In the cycle of death and rebirth, which could go on inf uh, infinitely, right? And we would be reborn depending on what sort of karma we accumulate, right? But again, so your karma will determine what you will be reborn as. And so again, even though we want to eventually leave samsara and achieve union with Brahman, one might think like, okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm living a human life this time, and I know enlightenment is important, but I'm just going to put it off, you know, I'm going to put off gaining enlightenment for a, a next life, right? So I'm just going to have fun in this life and do what I want, and then I'll just, you know, I'll be reborn and I'll get a second chance. Well, to deter that way of thinking or approaching this notion of reincarnation, it's important to understand that karma can only ever be accumulated if you are born as a human being, right? So let's say that you waste this human life doing a lot of bad things. Well, then you're going to be on the sort of uh, existential timeout in one of the lower realms of existence, right? You might be reborn as a slug or an animal for a long time. And so you don't want to waste this life, right? You want to make sure that you make the most of being born as a human and try to do, try to earn as much good karma as you can. And if you'd like to know a little bit more about the other realms of existence, you can click on this link up here in pink, right? What you will be reborn as to get to know uh, the different uh, realms of existence, which we'll also see again in uh, Buddhism. So again, if you are born uh, in, uh, when you are born in samsara, you will adopt a certain jiva or individual personality based on a combination of the karma you've accumulated as well as the choices that you make. And this is the formulation of your soul, right? So your Atman is sort of the underlying facet, right, or thing that exists, but there are going to be certain forces or gunas that will rule over your soul. And those, again, will be determined by your karma. So all of us, it's important to note, have all three gunas. We're just going to have them in different amounts. And so when we have one guna ruling over our soul, again, that will determine which caste we are born into, right? What form of reincarnation we take. And thus, whatever caste you're born into, it is seen as the fact that you deserve to be there, right? Which is why you can't move from one caste to another, right? So each person, again, will have each of these three gunas, but they will, we will have them in different amounts, right? Which correspond to our caste as a result of the karma that we have accumulated. All right, so again, for more information about the gunas and how they function, please take a look at the rest of the PowerPoint.